Sushanandaji, Swami Prabhupadanandaji, and friends. You all know that love is blind. Swami Sadhananda has always been very kind to me. He has always seen in me many switch do not exist. He said he had with him a two piece bio to develop me. I don't know who gave him that bio. <laughs> I hope he didn't write out himself. <laughs> Let me say how happy I am that uh, I'm able to visit this place. It's lovely. Yesterday we went around the forests. Many trees on top of the strings to me. And also plants, the leaves, the lotuses, with which I am familiar, they are there too. Together they make this a beautiful place. Then of course you have also the saints over there, statues and other symbols. Always reminding you that this is a holy place. You feel that as soon as you step into its grounds, that it is a holy place. You feel that. And that is exactly what makes a place holy. Wherever holy men live, there is holiness. And here you have a real holy man from the Sultan of the Mayan Lord, more than 50 years. He has always been like this. We used to look at him and say, why don't you try to be like him? We are together. And most of us were younger than him but not too much younger, would look at him and say, why don't you try to be like him, the model of a monk, combining so many good qualities, qualities of head and heart, but more than anything else, the spirit of renunciation, scholarship, and above everything else, love for everybody. Love for the junior most monk and love for the senior most in the order. Always love him and himself, love him. All. That's the sort of man he has been always. And now that he is a teacher himself, I'm not surprised that people here love him so much. Somebody told me on the way, as we are coming yesterday, he loved by everybody. I remember how he was loved by everybody in the monastery at Peru, where we lived together. Those who were very senior loved him, and those who were very junior also loved him. I'm very happy that I am here this morning in a place where he is presiding. He is the teacher. I'm very, very glad to see this place and to see the 
people who have to come here to seek truth, to realize the ideals which Ramakrishna represents. <coughs> now to turn to our subject for discussion this morning, <coughs> universal religion. It's difficult to name one religion which is universal. <coughs> Maybe I think the religion that is closest to my heart is universal. Maybe another person also has the same feeling. He or she thinks the religion that I believe in is the best, it is universal. In fact, there are elements in all religions which are universal. You find certain common elements in all religions. And it is these common elements which are universal. But again, in each religion you find there are certain elements which are considered essential and certain elements which are not essential. Unfortunately for us, most of us are too much preoccupied with the non-essentials of religion. We have to make a distinction between what is essential and what is not essential in religion. But that is exactly what we fail to do. We tend to be too much uh, occupied with the non essentials Things important, maybe important up to a point. You need them. Take the case of rituals, for instance. Each religion has some rituals, has to have some rituals. There is no religion without rituals. Some rituals are there. They have to be there. You cannot dispense with them. We cannot say, no, I don't need any rituals. In fact, life is full of rituals. When two friends meet, they greet each other, they put out their hands, they shake hands with each other. Why do they do that? Why do they have to do that? But that is how we have been brought up rituals. I see you I greet you. I show signs of love and friendship. Not that it's necessary. Once in a while, maybe. When we meet after a long time, but whenever we meet, we greet each other. Ritual. You do me some favor. Please give me a cup of tea. I say thank you. That's not necessary. But still, you do it. You cannot do without it. You think if you do not say thank you, that is an omission on your part. And you will let us scold yourself. Why didn't you say thank you? You should have said thank you. In India, as you know, they do not say thank you. If mother gives you a cup of milk, let us say, and you say thank you, mother will be surprised. What do you mean by this? <laughs> Why do you have to say this? Not necessary. <coughs> but then each country or each society has its own norms, certain norms. They have grown up through centuries of culture. Difficult to explain why there are certain norms in certain countries which are not to be found in other countries. Difficult to tell. Maybe there is also a difference between one individual and another individual. One individual th thinks. It's a question of priorities. One individual thinks, well, I have to have these norms. For me, these are 
norms. I have to have the I cannot well ignore them. But another individual may say, well, they are not necessary. So far as I am concerned, I can ignore them. So rich jobs, necessary. Necessary. No one perhaps tries to understand why there are rituals. In every religion there are rituals. Often these rituals sort of stand in the way of different groups of people, people of different <coughs> religious denominations coming together. These rituals. You attach too much importance to rituals. You think they are the whole of religion. To you they are very important. Thank you. It is very important to a certain individual, also to a certain culture. Thank you. I must say thank you. Similarly, the certain rituals sort of occupy the central place in the whole religious system, which is rather a hindrance to people of different religious groups coming together and trying to find a place where they can meet. You perhaps know there is a saying, religion is one, but religions are many. Religion is one, but religions are many. What do you mean when you say religion is one, but religions are many? When you say religions, you mean sectarian religions. When you say religion is one, you mean the essence of religion is one. It is this essence which is common to all religions, which is universal. But what is this essence? <coughs> if you study different religions, you find the need for a sense of security that has given rise to religion. In all religions, you have this search for security. All of us individually or collectively are seeking security. We want security. When we see God, we feel when we have a God to look after us, we are safe, we are secure. <coughs> we pray to God, please look up after us, please protect us, help us. This life is indeed a matter of struggle. I'm always struggling. There is nobody who says, I have no struggle. Yes. If you say you have nothing to be afraid of nothing, that you have to contend with nothing, that sort of poses any problem to you, that if everything is easy with you, everything is simple. No, there is no one who can say, Life is not a struggle, it is a struggle, continuous struggle. If you do not struggle, if there is no struggle for you, that means you are not making any progress at all. This little furniture for me has no struggle, has no problems, has nothing to worry about. Happy, it is content. But it is only a piece of furniture. A living being, a man especially, an animal is satisfied if it has its food and a place to stay somewhere. It's satisfied, but a man is never satisfied. That is the nature of man. Thank God that man is not easily satisfied. Discontent. We all have discontent. You are rich, 
rich, you have money, plenty of money. Or else you are the richest man in the neighborhood. If somebody asks you, are you happy, are you satisfied with yourself? You will say, no, I am not. I am part of the unhappiest man. You are healthy, you are strong. You have no health problems, still you are not happy. You are a scholar, everybody admires you for your scholarship. You are not satisfied, you are not happy. Discontent. That's the characteristic of man. We are looking for something which will give us a sense of security, a sense of happiness, a sense of fulfillment, a sense of being full, somehow or other. We have the feeling we are not full, a sense of inadequacy. I am not adequate, not quite complete. I am not complete. Most of us are indeed not complete. Truncated, fragmented. We are just human fragments. So that is this art for going forward, for growth, for development, for achieving higher and higher levels. Maybe levels in terms of wealth, levels in terms of scholarship, in terms of power. We love power, all of us. We want to be powerful, I want to dominate over other people. Maybe political power, social power, financial power, academic power. So there is a sense of inadequacy, a sense of void, emptiness in all of us. And we do look for something that will give us this sense of fulfillment. Oh yes, I have achieved whatever I wanted. I am happy, I am complete. It is this art that makes you <coughs> religious. This sense of security. <coughs> Most of our religions have had their origin from the fear of natural forces. <coughs> Nature was very unkind at one time. The civilization imposed of is nothing but the result of man's victory over nature. The forces of nature were hostile. We are afraid of the hostile forces of nature. We thought of some power, somebody, someone benign to me, will be kind to me, will be on my side, will help me overcome these forces of nature, hostile to me, giving me trouble. I want to overcome them. Look for some supernatural powers, more than natural, higher than natural power, and we give it the name of God or whatever else you like. But we soon discovered, just as there are hostile forces outside, there are also hostile forces inside. In me, right in me. To begin with, man was not conscious of the hostile forces within him, but as he has progressed and developed from experience, he has now discovered that there are also hostile forces within him. I am my own enemy. The Gita says, you are your own friend, but you are also your own enemy. In fact, when I am enemy to myself, I am hostile to myself. I become completely uncontrollable. Maybe you can control external nature. In fact, man's progress today indicates
wish that it is possible that in the near future man will be able to overcome nature altogether. Maybe he has already done it. Think of man now conquering space, traveling from one planet to another planet. Isn't it comparable? Man has done that, but has he conquered himself? Can he control his anger? his greed, his jealousy, his other weaknesses, not yet. There are exceptions, of course. There are some people who have done that. So, you have two kinds of religion. There are common elements in all religion. This thrust for finding a place in some person, I can depend upon, will always be with me, always on my side, always helping me, protecting me, guiding me. So, this, I look for that power outside. We look up to heaven. We do not know where he is. Maybe he is up there, he is not on this earth anyway. We can't see him anywhere. Maybe he is up there. But we look for him outside, some power. That's why you find a tribe, the tribe especially, totems, some totems representing that great power. They do not know the name of that power, they do not know the source of that power, but they have the totems which represent that external power which can help them overcome the external hostility of nature. But that is one kind of religion. Nowadays you know scholars divide religions or how many religions there are. No one knows how many. But there are some religions well known, recognized. Even among those well-known religions, there are some which are designated as higher religions. Higher religions, some religions are lower religions. Well, it's not said to make this kind of discrimination. You cannot name, oh, here is a religion which is to be classified as lower, or here is a religion which is to be classified as higher. But by and large, you can find some religions concerned more with the hostile, hostile forces outside. And they look for the, their protection from a force, a power, an authority, or an individual also outside. They look for God outside. Let us use the word God, because that is what is God to most of us. Someone, some power, some principle, which we, our protector, will be our protector. So there are some religions which are very much concerned about the hostility of nature and they look for some power, some person <coughs> who will protect them from hostile nature. But then there are also other religions which concern themselves with the search for protection from the hostile forces within and they search for that protection, not outside. They search for that protection within themselves. They realize that if they had to be happy, if they had to feel that they are safe, if they had to have security, if they had to overcome the hostile. 
by forces within themselves, their own minds, their own propensities, their weaknesses. They must discover that power which will help to overcome this hostile forces within, also within, within, not outside. It is this kind of religion which is usually described as higher, something that helps you grow stronger and stronger. Your strength, by your own strength, that you, which you, with which you can overcome your own weaknesses, strength, your own strength, of which you are not conscious which is within you, lying hidden. But you tap the sources of that strength within, discover them, so you find. You have no reason to be afraid of the forces which are within, which are troubling you, which are made you so weak. You discover new sources of strength within. You discover yourself. You come to know your real identity. So long as you had been in the habit of thinking that you were weak and you were good for nothing. But soon you discover that there is no reason why you should think that you were good for nothing, that you were helpless, that you have to depend upon extraneous help. No, I don't need any help from outside. If I need any help, well, I have it within me. I will help myself, self-help. I don't have to depend upon others. So that is another kind of religion. It's usually described as higher religion. Something having to do with your own self. Religion is a science. Just as you have science, physical science, to overcome nature, external nature. The higher religion is also a science. Science which helps you to overcome your weaknesses, the forces within, hostile to you, that trouble you, give you no rest. In fact, don't you see how many of us commit suicide? And when you examine the circumstances in which they commit suicide, you say, what was that that made the man commit suicide? That's not really very serious. All imagination. I begin to imagine you are conspiring against me. Oh, I can't trust my neighbors, I can trust with my partners in business. They are conspiring against me. I am imagining. Maybe they are conspiring, but surely they are not conspiring in the manner that the man begins to imagine. You imagine. You examine it. There are people among us who have health problems. Ask their doctors what do you think about the health problems of such, such person, the doctor will say, yes, he has some problem, but nothing very serious, at least not as serious as he thinks they are. We imagine, we exaggerate, we love to exaggerate, we love to think that we have serious health problems. That is a peculiarity about most of us. And religion is that science which helps you discover your sources of strength, gives you a new sense of identity, makes you sure of yourself, gives you self-confidence, asks you to go forward, meet the enemy, halfway, if not in his own place something within you discover you are not weak, which you have always been thinking you were. You become a new individual. I 
I said, religion is a science which helps you to grow. Growth. There are two kinds of growth. One kind, horizontal. I acquire property. I acquire power. I am known to be a very, very influential person. I control many people. I am head of a state. That's one kind of growth, horizontal. Another kind of growth, vertical, within, inside. I am growing within. I am growing better, 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 and better every day. I am growing. You do not see it. People around do not see it. Sometimes I myself am not aware that I am growing. I am growing better and better and better. This growth within, there is always a limit to horizontal growth. But there is no limit whatsoever to what I describe as vertical growth, moral growth. I want to grow to perfection. I want to be perfect. I want to be perfect. Be thou perfect as thy father in heaven is. I want to be perfect. And there is no limit to this kind of growth within. Now, how can that happen? <laughs> With people who are seeking inner growth, and people who practice higher religion are people who are seeking inner growth, not so much <coughs> horizontal growth. Yes, I need some horizontal growth, some amount, but that's not what is going to satisfy me. I want to grow to perfection. I want my particular growth moral and spiritual growth. Not that I am going to have any change in my physiognomy. Maybe there will be a change, some change, but that is not important to me. I want to see that I am a better individual than what I was before. And that is what religion promises. The science of being and becoming and from it you become the same. Changing, change within some chemicals. What are those chemicals? Call them prayer, call them meditation, call them yoga, call them whatever it is. Religion is that science which concerns itself with being and becoming, with your inner growth. Changes you will become a new individual altogether. Your outlook on life changes. Your attitude towards everything changes. Most of all, your attitude towards your own self. That's the most important. Attitude, your own attitude towards full of faith, full of courage, full of joy, full of peace, and full of the sense of security which you have been missing so long. You have a sense of security. Oh, I know where I am. I'm sure of my grounds. I know my principles. I know my norms. I don't depend on anybody else. I'm not anybody's slave. I am my own master. You have that sort of feeling within. But then, how can that happen? You say, higher religion. What is higher religion? Is it possible to define higher religion? Higher religion is nothing but a commitment to certain principles. What principles, for instance? I would say truth. Truth, that is the first principle. Truth. You commit yourself to truth. You are honest. You are honest not because of law. The law says you have to be honest, so you are honest.
the slope. Yes, your honors because of a law, a law which you yourself have laid down for yourself. It is your own law. The sanction is from within, not from without, not the state, not the police, not any extraneous power, the power within my own consciousness. I love to be honest. I am honest not because of fear or punishment, neither because of any desire for reward here or elsewhere. No reward. I don't care for any reward. Honesty is his own reward. I don't want any other reward. This sort of commitment as Swami Vivekananda says, you can give up truth. You, you can give up anything for truth. You can give up everything for truth. But you cannot give up truth for anything. Truth above everything else. That kind of love for truth, that kind of commitment to truth, honesty, is the best policy. But Gandhiji said, honesty is the only policy. So far as I am concerned, honesty is the only policy. I don't know of any other policy, good, bad. This kind of commitment, this is how, how do you judge a religious man? By the miracles he performs. Who cares for miracles? If there is a miracle, it is in this phenomenon that a man is honest. Under all circumstances, at all hours, all of us are honest. But sometimes we are honest only in given circumstances. Take care of those circumstances. <coughs> committed himself to the principle of truth. A man who is seeking inner growth, seeking security. Only an honest man is fearless, afraid of nothing. In Vedanta philosophy, abhayam, abhayam, beyond, go beyond fear. If you are honest, you are not afraid of anybody. No one can So it is this kind of higher religion, this commitment to truth, truth, all religions, whether you call them higher religions or call them lower religions, doesn't matter, religion, the essence of religion, which is common to all, is this commitment to truth. <laughs> now it may be this concept of truth is not the same with all of us. A child has his own concept of truth. He, well, steals money from his father's pockets or it may be from his mother's purse. Now, if <coughs> father or mother asks him to <coughs> take this money, he's honest with you, he said. One kind of honesty, but good, is necessary. Is how you begin. Truth, to begin with, is only truth in speech. Truth only in action. But truth must be pursued also in thought. It must be practiced also in thought. Truth above everything else. Truth is God. According to one of the Upanishads, Nahi Shuddhaya Parodharma, no religion higher than truth. Truth is the backbone of religion, the soul of religion, truth. All religions, high or low. a premium on truth, highest premium on truth. But again, 
this concept of truth is not the same with us all. As you grow, as a child grows, the meaning of truth also grows, becomes bigger, becomes more subtle, more sublime. It acquires new dimensions, the word truth. As I was saying, in your deeds you are honest, but maybe you are not honest in your speech. No, that won't do. Maybe you are honest also in your speech. You know, in, in the scriptures, again and again, they stress that there must be harmony between your thought and your speech and your action. If you are a votary of truth, if you are a true religious man, then you must reflect your honesty, not only in your action, not only in your speech, but also in your thought. So truth about everything else. Truth is God. Truth is the goal of religion. I want to pursue that truth to a degree of perfection. Even unconsciously, I will not tell a lie. Unconsciously, not in fun even. Some of you will be interested to know that Swami Brahmananda, who was then known as Rakhal, the young man living with Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna was training him. He used to love him. He used to say, Rakhal is my own son. <coughs> now he was very strict. Ramakrishna was very strict with people whom he loved because he wanted that they should grow up with high ideals and they should live up to those ideals not just at a certain moment in certain circumstances always so one day he looked at Rakha and he said what's the matter something wrong with you what did you do I see on your face Rather darkness. You are looking rather dark. You are not bright. You normally look bright, but now I find you looking rather different. What's wrong with you? Is it nothing wrong with me that I can think of? Oh no. Did you do anything wrong? He thought for a while. He said, Yes, I did tell a lie, but I was joking. Only in fun, I told a lie. No, not even in fun. You can't tell a lie. No. So, truth, not only that I am honest in my action, I am honest in my action, in my speech, and in my thought. Always. Truth. But that is the idea. It is this truth which is the essence of religion, which is to be found in every religion, in every religion, in every religion you find the arch for perfection. I want to be perfect. Now it may be the concept of perfection differs from one religion to another. A lower religion may be will be content with a kind of perfection of which is very limited in its application. Perfection, yes, I want to be perfect. As a warrior, I want to be perfect. As a leader, I want to be perfect. As a father, so on. But real perfection is perfection difficult to define it. Each individual has to find for himself what is perfection. No limit to your growth. Higher and higher and higher. That is really no religion 
described as universal. Again, every religion can be described as universal in the sense that in each religion you find this thrust for achieving higher levels of excellence in terms of character, in terms of my dealings with my human beings. I have my own excellence. I am perfect, let us say. But I do not stop there. You find in all religions concern for fellow beings, love. Oh, well, yes, I am a perfect man. I am a model man in the eye of many people. They love me. They think I am a great saint. But I am not concerned with that, content with that. I would like to help others. I would like to serve others. I am not happy when I find there are people around who are in difficulty. They are suffering physically and mentally. I can't be selfish. If I am selfish, I am not perfect. I find perfection which I have, which I think I have, which everybody thinks I have, <laughs> is of no use to me. Unless I am able to save others, to serve others. So in all religions you find there is this stress on truth, moral growth, moral perfection, limitless, till perhaps you are identical with God. We do not know what God is like. God is a name we give to a person in whom we find the kind of perfection that we are all looking for. When we see somebody who is perfect in every respect, we say, here is God. We say, here is an incarnation of God. Here is the Son of God. There is no way of knowing what God is like. We do not know. We cannot know. But all we know that God is perfect. And any individual who shows the highest degree of perfection, we say, ah, here is my hero. I love him. I admire him. I want to be like him. My model. So, in all religions you have these two elements. There are other elements. There are <coughs> many elements common. But these two are perhaps most common and most important. Truth and concern for other people, love and goodwill, friendship. Only a truly religious man can love. We talk of love, but love in most cases is selfish. I love for my own sake. If I love anybody, I love for my own sake. But truly selfless love, true love, genuine love, is love which a religious man has. Selfless. I don't want anything in return. I love. I am glad that I am able to do something for you. I don't want you to say thank you. It doesn't matter at all whether you are grateful to me or not. This love, selfless love, love without asking anything in return, and this concern with truth, with honesty, with that ideal moral, moral perfection. Man has to grow, he's growing slowly, better and better and better. That's the great challenge before us. We have done wonderful things in terms of science and technology. Almost conquered external nature, but we have not yet conquered internal nature. Religion is that science which takes
gives us how we can learn to control ourselves. If so and so has been able to control himself in his own mind, he's his own master. Buddha once said, somebody was praising a man because he had conquered some other country than his own. Buddha said, no, I would say he's a great hero. A real hero is one who has conquered himself. So that is the challenge before us. And it is religion which helps us, gives us the knowledge, the technology. It is a matter of technology, some techniques. What is your law? It is that technology helps you how you have to control yourself. Rituals, some rituals. They are also helpful. How you control yourself. The crux of the matter is you have to conquer yourself. And you do that with the help of religion. And to the extent that this principle of self-control is in every religion good or call it bad if you like, higher or lower, doesn't matter how you describe it. But in all religions you have this principle of self-control, of truth and concern for fellow beings. This is where all religions meet. This is what makes all religions universal. But again, there are some religions in which this accent on the on self-control and concern for other people is most pronounced. And it is that religion which is the essence of 